podcast is titled The Real Reason They Hate You. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, as you join, you know exactly what to do, and that is to hit that share button. We're looking at the text according to Genesis chapter 37. Please put this in the comments, Genesis 37. We'll be focusing on the first, let's say 13 verses, but we'll see where the Holy Spirit permits us to stop. But Genesis 37 is our base chapter for this evening's message. I'm so happy to see you. How are Jesus? Hallelujah. Now, just a gentle reminder, remember that every Sunday morning, including this Sunday at 1030 a.m., we will be in the Marilock Hall at St. John's University. In fact, we have already started to gather there. This will be our fourth Sunday. And as you know, miracles, healings, deliverances have been taking place in the house of the Lord. And this Sunday promises to be no different. Or if there's any difference, it will be even greater manifestations of the power of God because of the faith of his people. All right. Remember that the St. John's University is located at 8000 Utopia Parkway in Queens, New York. 11439 is the zip code. Please remember to use gate number four once you enter through gate number four, because the university has numerous gates. You're going to park to your left and on foot, you're going to make the first right. You're going to look for the building that has the sign campus store. The Marilock Hall is right next to that sign. Amen. So as you join, especially those of you who are on YouTube, be sure to hit that like and share button, especially the like button, so that you will cause this broadcast to populate in some people's feeds who need to hear tonight's word. I believe somebody's soul will be uplifted, somebody's spirit will be edified by the dissecting of tonight's word. Hallelujah. Genesis 37. Again, the title of this evening's message is The Real Reason They Hate You. Hallelujah. I don't know who this message is for, but I know that I will be speaking directly to the person for whom this message has been sent. The real reason they hate you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Just raise your hands if you've already shared, especially those who are on Facebook. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for doing so. Glory to God, especially in light of the fact that many individuals are no longer getting their notifications. Please, thank you so much for sharing. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you that you will be opening up the scripture to us. We thank you, Father, that it will be opened with power, with much assurance and full of the Holy Ghost. We thank you, Father, for the illumination that will come to us because your word will be rightly divided. Hallelujah. We thank you, Father. The Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Father, I thank you for the grace that you have given to your servant to study your word. Lord, we thank you for wisdom and understanding that comes from the Holy Spirit. I pray that he will be enlarged in this vessel as you pour out to your people. Lord, we thank you for the grace with which your word will be accurately dissected this evening. I thank you for hearts and ears that are ready to receive. I thank you, Father, for eyes that are already opened. Lord, we thank you for the anointing with which your word will go forth. We thank you that it will be riveting. We thank you that it will be piercing not just because of the effect of the word itself, but God Almighty, there are atmospheres that will be pierced, hallelujah, by the power with which this word will be delivered in our midst. So Father, we thank you in advance. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. 
Now, I believe that we have the title in the comments already. I'm not seeing it on YouTube. The reason they hate you so much. The real reason they hate you. The Lord wants you to understand that this evening, right? Sister Nadine, Sister Sharma, Sister Khadija, Sister Sarah, Brittany, Tantan, the real reason they hate you. Let's go. We're going to read from the first verse of Genesis 37 so we may get some context here. Hallelujah. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. Hallelujah. Now these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, please make a note of this, that Joseph was 17 years of age. Please put this in the comments. Being 17 years old, he was feeding the flock with his brethren. Hallelujah. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's concubines. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream and he told it to his brethren, and they hated him even more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood around my sheaf and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, shall you indeed reign over us or shall you indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream. Hallelujah. And he told it to his brethren and said, behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. Hallelujah. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to you, to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. And his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not your brothers feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send you unto them. And he said to him, Here am I. We're going to pause there. So, for those of you who have just joined, our base text is taken from Genesis 37, and we're focusing on the first 13 verses, verse 1 to 13. Now, again, if you've just joined on YouTube, please ensure that as you join, you like and you share for the rest of us who are not aware that we're even live right now. Okay, Sister Kareen, Sister Janet, Sister Cora, Sister Miriam, good to see you, Sister Sharon and Sister Gina. Hallelujah. Let us get into the word. Now, the Bible says that Jacob had his sons. We would have been introduced to them in earlier chapters in Genesis. We learned how he had two wives, <clears throat> Leah, Rachel. And we also learned how when they were having difficulties, 
with pregnancies or getting pregnant, that they got their maid servants involved. And these became concubines of Jacob. Together, there were children, 12 sons. Jacob also had a daughter. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, by this time, the word of God says that Jacob was dwelling in a strange land. Amen. Now, some things were about to happen, and the Lord wants us to pay attention to them because some of us are today experiencing some of the very things that were explained in this chapter. Some of us are older now, but because the Lord wants to give you some clarity about what is at the foundation of some of the things you see manifest in your family and some of the ways in which people treat you, even your family members. He's looking at scripture. He's using scripture to bring light to these things that you have experienced in the past. And so I pray that your heart is open. I pray that you will pay such keen attention to his word that you will no longer leave this kind of atmosphere confused. And you will live your tomorrow like you know where you're going and like you understand truly who you are. I pray that revelatory knowledge will come out of the word as it's rightly divided tonight in the mighty precious name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, our Lord. Now, let's look at verse three. The Bible says, now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. Now, the father of all these sons took a special liking or love, because this is a better word, for Joseph, he had other sons, sons that he had with his wives, Leah, Rachel. But what was it about this Joseph that he loved so much? From a father's heart, we're not sure how a parent determines what makes him or her gravitate toward a certain child more than others. But I wanna speak on the part of Joseph, seeing that I'm not yet a parent. Let me speak for Joseph, a child. Joseph had nothing to do with this love that his father was pouring out toward him. He did not elect himself and say, daddy, love me more. He did not volunteer himself in the area of the reception of love from his parents without his input, without his contribution, so to speak. His father loved him more. Now, one of the things we'll get to understand is that part of the reason the Holy Spirit has shared this story is because of who Joseph represents in this incident. Joseph represented a type of Christ. In scripture, you'll come across a lot of characters who were used by the Holy Spirit as types of Christ. Isaac was a type of Christ. Even as his father Abraham was about to sacrifice his only son, so did the father in heaven sacrifice his one and only son, who was Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Now here comes another type manifesting through the life of Joseph. The father loved Joseph more than his other brethren. Similarly, the father loved Christ, Jesus, more than the rest of the sons of Israel. By the time Jesus was launched into ministry, 
understand that something very significant occurred on the day of his baptism. The Bible said that when he was baptized, something that the Lord had allowed John the Baptist to see. There was a voice that spoke out of heaven that said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. We have not seen such a thing being said about anybody else in the, Old Te in the New Testament. We have seen how God used powerful individuals. He has used John the Baptist. We heard about the faithful priest, Zacharias, who got a miracle. He and his wife having a child. We have heard of all these faithful people. But there was only one about whom scripture says the father himself allowed his audible voice to be heard. And this was Jesus. He said, this is my son in whom I am pleased. I love him. He openly expressed his love for this son of his. Now understand this, that Israel belongs to God. God had entered a covenant with Israel for many years before Christ even came in flesh. And so Israel was seen as God's people, God's children. So sons in Israel, males in Israel, Jews, hallelujah, were rightly supposed to be God's children. Amen. And so when Christ came, he was among children of God. He was among his brethren. He was among his brothers because God, the father has adopted Israel as his own. The seed of Israel, the person has become his children. So when Jesus came, Jesus was amongst his brothers. All those Jews, even the very ones who participated in his cru crucifixion. Hallelujah. Those who related to him by blood, as well as those who he would see growing up. Some had become teachers in Israel. Some were lawyers. Some were physicians. Irrespective of the field in which they were by virtue of them being descendants of Abraham, they were brothers to Christ. Now in the same way that Jacob loved Joseph more than his other brothers, the father loved Jesus more than all the others of his day in Israel. There was something about this one that moved the heart of the father. Of course, he owns the others. Jacob owned the other children he had. And I'm sure he knew them because they were his. But there was something about this one called Joseph. And similarly, when Jesus came, there was something about him that was different from what the Lord saw in the rest of them who were in his day. Many said they were worshiping him. Many said they were doing all these religious activities to please him. They were offering stuff. They were sacrificing things. Yet we saw where God did not express openly his love toward any of them. But he did for Jesus though. Because there was something about this Jesus that man could not see, that man could not detect as yet. But of course, our almighty God who knows all things was seeing beyond this baby, beyond the fact that this was an infant when he was born. God was seeing his future. God was looking straight into his heart and seeing how he would obey him and obey the instructions he would give to him even when the odds would be against him. 
Could it be that Jacob had detected some little things about the person of Joseph? As a matter of fact, we understand that at this point in Joseph's life, he was 17 years of age. So what I wonder if throughout that 17 year period, Jacob was observing some things in Joseph that he did not necessarily observe in the rest of his children. Understand this, that this special love that was being exuded by Jacob toward Joseph is not something that Joseph had asked for. It was just the love of the father. Jesus did not ask the father to open heaven and to speak. Jesus did not ask the father to validate him openly. He was a humble person. He was a quiet person for the most part. And we would have seen throughout his ministry how there were times when he healed individuals and he would say to them, do not talk about this. Just go your way. Don't tell anyone about this. There were times when he said, it's not yet my time. He said this to his own mom. He said, what do I have to do with you, woman? It's not yet my time. Yet the father saw it fit to do this thing that he never asked him to do. Now watch how a 17-year-old boy is about to suffer for something that he did not ask for. Watch how someone in his youth is about to experience series of interruptions. Life is about to throw some things at him for something that he has no control over, for a reality that he did not bring into existence because he has no power over who his father favors or prefers. I believe the Lord is tonight going to be ministering unto someone who you don't know what you've done. As a matter of fact, you know you have done nothing. Because truth be told, you have not worked for the love that God has shown toward you. Hallelujah. You're going to understand why you have to suffer the way you do. And why the people who are looking at you in your workspace, in the church where you worship, in places where you go, you're going to understand why they look at you the way they do. I hope that you're going to understand how it is that you don't even have the kind of qualification some of these people have. Yet they're fighting against you. Shouldn't it be the other way around? I'm not driving a Mercedes Benz. So why do you hate me? I'm not the executive in the corporate world. You are. So why do you hate me? I'm not the one who is traveling back and forth. I'm not the one who has the visa. I'm not the one who was approved. So why are you hating me? Some of you are probably saying, I'm not the one who went to college. I'm not the one who got the scholarship and all these opportunities. I'm not the one who got the medal. I'm not the one who won the race. I'm not the one who broke the record. Why am I having to suffer like this? Now, as we have seen and are seeing with Joseph, his father loved him. It was totally up to him. He loved him more than the others. There was something about Joseph. The Bible said he loved him because he was the son of his old age. Perhaps that was the whole reason or the main reason, maybe there were other things too. But as for you, 
Maybe you don't know exactly that reason that causes God to love you so much. That when bullets were being sprayed in that crowded place where you were, hallelujah, that the one beside you got hit and not you. Hallelujah. Could it be that people on the outside are looking at these things, are analyzing these things? They realize how you are always escaping misfortunes. They realize how you're always escaping fatalities. What is it about you? You yourself do not yet understand. In fact, you're still questioning it in your heart. While the people on the outside are seeing that this has got to be love. Can one woman be so loved by God? What is it about Alicia so much? What is it about Sonia so much? What is it about Tasia? That causes her to get ahead when everybody else has to be struggling. What is it that causes Sharon to get all these second chances? When everybody else was turned down and was told, no, you got to apply again 10 years from now. Why is it that Shanika always experiences these exemptions? She's not qualified and she's always late. Yet there's always someone there to say, you know what? This is not our standard and this is not our rules, but I'm going to do this for you. You might not understand it. But the people who witness these myriads of favors in your life, they're making their observations and it's becoming more and more pronounced. That you are loved by the Father. What is it that you've done? You will never know. Joseph was only 17. He had not yet reached the age to start working and to start providing for his family. Because see, many parents, they favor a certain child because of what that child is capable of doing for him or her. They favor the one who is now doing a master's because they know that not long from this, that one will be able to bring in some monies. That one will be able to take you finally to the supermarket you've always wanted to go. Joseph had not yet reached the age to start doing certain things. So what was it that was causing his father to love him so much? Love that he did not ask for. Involuntary love that was being showed toward him, that was showering down on him, was the first reason his brothers did not like him. There are individuals you will come across who will not like you because you are loved by a certain individual or by a certain group of individuals. There are people who will not know you. They'll not have a conversation with you. They'll not exchange a word with you sometimes. Yet they do not like you because of who they see associated with you. Some of you, because everywhere you go, people seem to take a liking to you. It doesn't matter where you're working. It doesn't matter which department you are in. They could shift you today. They could switch you. It, it really doesn't matter. Wherever you go, it's like you're always shining. That alone might be the reason someone doesn't like you. They don't need to know you. I think they know enough about you. And what is it that they know? They know that the father loves you. 
They know that the hand of God is upon you. You are blessed. They know that you've got backing from heaven. They know that the windows of heaven are opened up for you. They know that there is a light that radiates from you. And so they don't need to go into your past. Because truth be told, if they were to really do some research about you, they'll find out that you're from the poorest family. You live in the poorest looking house. You wear the worst looking of clothes at home. Your fridge is empty. You cannot eat the things that you want. You cannot buy the things that you want. If they were to dig deep about who you really are and, and your upbringing. Sometimes they won't get the chance to do all that. Sometimes they won't be interested in knowing all about you like that. All they want to know is that the father loves you. And on that basis, they will start to despise you. And such was the case for our brother, Joseph. Please make a note that at the beginning of this story, the Bible says that Joseph was pasturing the flock with his brothers. Later on, I'm going to show you how things turned and how this reality had changed. Now, among the things that Jacob did to openly express his love toward Joseph, even as the father openly showed love toward Jesus Christ, is that he made for him a coat of many colors. I want you to think about this. Throughout scripture, I've not come across one verse that stated to me that Jacob was a dressmaker or a tailor. Have you? In the past couple of verses in which the Holy Spirit talked about Jacob, we knew him as the liar, the deceiver, the con artist, the trickster. Amen. And there was a point when we got the impression that he was a homeboy, as opposed to his brother Esau, who was a hunter. But now the word of God says, that Jacob made a coat for his son. This was something that was very out of the ordinary. For Jacob to take the time to knit together a coat for his son says a lot about the depth of the love he had for this one. He made it himself, basically. It means he didn't go out to the flea market and chose it from somebody's closet or from somebody's line of clothing. Uh -uh. He didn't search for it and pick it out of a bag. So for sure, we know that nobody had worn this coat prior to Joseph getting it. He made it from scratch. It would have taken him time to make it. A lot of thought would have had to go into making it. Because you got to envision it before you can cause it to materialize. Eh? He would have had to think about this. Deeply. Before he started to stitch and to knit. He would have had to consider the colors he would use, the style, the cutting, the shape, the length, all of these things. Jacob did this for Joseph. We don't hear that he has done this for anybody else. Any coat that the others were wearing 
were coats that were bought from the market. There were coats that were made by others and, you know, they went out and they got them from the retail store or whatever they had in those days. An old man, understand this. Jacob was no longer young. Jacob was an old man now, almost getting ready to be a grandfather. Took the time to put this coat together. And even if he got some help from maybe a sister or a neighbor, the idea of the coat was strictly his, was original to him. And for that reason, they hated Joseph even more because they got something that was very original from the father. My God, some of you have been given things by God that in this life, you probably will never come across anybody who possesses it, my God. The way in which the father loves you, he has given you a kind of ability that is very rare. You will search out your whole country and you'll never find anybody who can do it the way you do. He might have you migrate to another country, even another continent, and you still can't come across another who can do it exactly the way you do it. That thing is original. That thing, hallelujah, was made solely for you. It is to your fitting. Everything about it is just right. Everything about it is just for you. If another puts on the coat of Joseph, perhaps it will end up being too tight, too slack, too short, too tall. There are some things that are passed down from the hand of a father that are just made for you. Your personality complements this thing. Your character complements this thing. Everything about you complements this thing. And that's what makes it so special. It's the whole combination. It's how everything works together. The gifts he gave you, the anointing he gave you, the power, the zeal, the passion he gave you. When you put them together with your character, how meek you are, how submissive you are, how humble you are because of what life did to you when you were growing up. When people see this thing manifest through you, all they got to say is, this comes straight from the Father. This was hand cut. This was an original design. This one was definitely made for Vincent. This one is definitely for Donna. This one is strictly for Denise. And flesh and blood did not give that to Sharma. Flesh and blood did not give this thing unto Kenise. By the way, the whole thing works together. The way how you come to life when this thing that the Father has given you is in operation. I know, I know that no man gave this thing to you. It's strictly the Father who did. And when others see this thing, 
jealousy is going to be aroused in them. Because who are you? What is so special about you? You're younger than I. You're just 17, Joseph. How come we are out here in the field just like you? So what is it about you, Joseph? Now, let's get to something. The Bible says, that when the brothers saw that their father loved him than all his brethren, they hated him. So make a note that they hated him because of the love that the father showed him. They hate you because of the love your heavenly father shows you. Hallelujah. Now verse 5 says, and Joseph dreamed a dream and he told it to his brethren and they hated him yet the more. Let's find out the dream. And he said unto them, here I pray you this dream that I had. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright and behold, your sheaves stood around mine and they bowed down to my sheaf. I want us to understand the background against which this conversation was had. The Holy Spirit has already established in scripture that Joseph was hated by his brothers and that they could not speak to him in peace. So understand the contention behind the scenes, okay? Understand that there were some little conflicts that were occurring that were not necessarily detailed in scripture but y'all know that when someone hates you and you share the same space with that individual things will not go well most of the times amen you know what it's like to work with that person in your workplace who hates your guts you know how spiteful that person can be you know the many times that person tried to sabotage you. You know. So it's very intentional of the Holy Spirit to establish this fact. That there was no peace between them. Hallelujah. It was like 12 against one. They were carrying him in their hearts. Because they hated him, perhaps the communication between the two, Joseph and the group of brothers, was very lacking, was very little. You know when people hate you, they don't even want to look into your eyes. When people hate you, they, they don't even want to be in your presence for too long. When people hate you, sometimes they don't even want to touch you. When people hate you, after a while, a certain level of anger is built up in them toward you. Sometimes without you knowing, until you just say one thing, just one conversation one day will just cause that person to explode. So I want you to imagine what was going on behind the scenes. There was tension in the home. There was tension in the house of Joseph. Okay? Because his brothers hated the, the Holy Spirit. My God. Watch this. This is the Holy Spirit who's writing through the hands of Moses now. Okay? If it's the Holy Spirit who said they hated Joseph, understand that this is the one who knows the heart of every man. The Bible says he trieth the reins of the heart. And so if it's the Holy Spirit who said they hated Joseph, just understand that it's just what he said. It was more than them not liking him. They hated him, saith the Lord, not me. So 
against the background that there was this family that had a bit of strife, contention. The person who they hate to begin with gets up one morning and decides to share a dream. I can only imagine their faces as they stood there. I can only imagine what was going through their hearts. They're probably saying, here he goes now. What is he coming with now? Joseph said to them, I had a dream. And he started to share how they were in the field and they were gathering some stalks of grains and the stalk he was gathering or putting together, it arose and it stood upright and the stalks they were putting together all of a sudden surrounded that stalk that was upright and they were bowing down. The Bible says, according to verse eight, that his brethren said to him, shall you indeed reign over us? Shall you indeed have dominion over us? And the word of God says they hated him even more. Now, the brothers have just gotten a glance of something that was to come. But here is their dilemma. They don't know the time frame. God is so wise. Watch this. That he allowed Joseph to share the dream. Huh? But there are two things I want you to recognize that happened. First of all, the fact that Joseph shared the dream. Why did he even open his mouth? Could he not just keep it to himself? You know, many times I should even have had dreams and I shared them, especially when I just converted to Christianity. I would get all these powerful dreams and I would share them because one of the reasons was I wanted the interpretation. And the older I got and the more I understood my own dreams was the more regret I had that I shared these dreams with those people in the past. So because I know that sometimes we can get to that place in our lives where we start to blame ourselves and beat ourselves up because we, we, we see that we, our, our mouths were just loosed back then. We didn't have a filter. We just released everything and to the wrong people. But you know what? In the case of Joseph, and you're going to realize that sometimes with you also, God allowed him to share the dream for a reason. There are some dreams, some revelations that you'll get, some spiritual insights that you will get that the Holy Spirit will allow you to release. You know why? Because some of the very people to whom you're going to be sharing these revelations, they're going to help to advance the cause. They're going to help to bring the thing to pass. So there is a reason you feel it very strongly in your spirit to share this dream with your mom. There's a reason you are sharing this dream with that co-worker. You don't know it yet, but perhaps God knows that that co-worker possesses a certain trait that he is going to use, although this trait is negative. It is what he's going to use as a catalyst to bring to pass the very thing that you shared with them. So there's a time to hush up. And there's also a time to speak. Here's another reason God will allow you to speak some things that you are seeing and feeling. And another reason God will have the woman of God or the man of God call you out in public and tell you some prophetic things. There's a reason 
God did not permit that person to get your telephone number so that they would speak with you over the phone. There's a reason the thing was not done in private. There's a reason you couldn't hold your peace until you spoke about the thing. So don't blame yourself. Don't beat yourself up. Please always try to remember why you did it in the first place. Stop telling yourself you talk too much. Maybe you do sometimes, but in this case, you did the right thing. Hallelujah. I mentioned earlier that there are times when the very people to whom you are sharing such important information will be used to help to bring the thing to pass. Amen. But there are also other things that will happen, other benefits, other reasons. And one of those is this. When God publicly talks about something that is going to happen in your life, when the thing finally happens, he will get the glory. When God says, Babette, even though you are someone who has struggled in marriage and the whole community knows, I'm going to send a prophet to speak to you at a tent meeting where all of your neighbors will be gathered. See, God is so strategic and intentional. You think God doesn't know who the people are who are in that space where he's speaking to you? There's a reason you got the word when you went to Pastor Brown's church. There's a reason the woman of God spoke to you when you were at such a convention or conference. Because there are some people who are in that room who he will not just use to bring the thing, the thing to pass. But these individuals are going to be so involved in your life. Although right now they're doubting the prophetic word. They're going to be so involved in your life and so wanting to know your business. So nosy. That even though they are doubting the hand of God. And the word that was released over you. God is going to bring it to pass right in front of their faces. And when the thing manifests, they will know for sure that the Father loves you. Hallelujah. They will know for sure that education didn't do this. Okay? Links didn't do this. Connections didn't do this. Qualifications didn't do this. It's simply the love of God that has facilitated this in my life. Amen. So Joseph shares his dream when he could have kept it to himself for many reasons. The Lord permitted him to release this dream because he was going to get the glory in the presence of the very people who would hear it. And because God saw how he was being sabotaged, because God saw how he was, so to speak, the black sheep of the family, I believe that God has a special liking for people who are refused and rejected, honestly. There's something about people who others take advantage of when it comes to God. When Penina was having her children and she was showing off on Hannah, God heard Hannah. Hallelujah. When Leah was getting up in herself. Oh, first of all, let's talk about Leah a little bit. Remember that Leah was the one who was put in marriage first. But Jacob didn't like her. And when God saw that this man was legally married to this woman, but he, he didn't like her, 
God blessed her. There's something about people who are thrown under the bus. There's something about people who others reject that God takes a liking toward. How we know that this was the will of God for Joseph to speak about the dream, even though God knew they were going to hate him all the more? My God. My God. The Lord would have rebuked him. If the Lord wanted him to be quiet, he would have silenced him. Probably he would have given him a dream in which he was being rebuked. And perhaps as a dream interpreter himself, he would have gotten the revelation that, okay, God doesn't want me to speak. But he, I don't think he got such a dream or such a rebuke. So all the more reason he's going to share what he sees. Because it seems it is the will of God. So when one dream was hurtful and, and we thought that it was enough, here comes another dream. And he says to them, I dreamed that the sun, the moon, and the stars were bowing down to me. Hold on. Let's read it. Yes, they were bowing down to me. The Bible says that the brothers hated him because of what he dreamed and also because of the words he spoke. I want to dissect this rightly just now. I noticed that in both occasions, okay, in both incidences where he had dreams, the dreams had a lot of symbols. In the first dream, there were sheaves, stalks of wheat, and the stalks were bowing down. In the second dream, we're seeing another set of symbols, sun, moon, and stars. Have you ever asked yourself this question? Why did the Lord not just use him and them in the dream? Why couldn't God just give Joseph a straightforward dream in which Joseph is standing up and their brothers are literally bowing down? Why does he have to use stalks of wheat? And then why is he even using the sun and the moon and the stars? Why not just use the real people? Have you ever had dreams and, and you're saying to yourself, but after you see how it manifests, why have you ever asked God like, God, why didn't you just use us, the real people? Okay, my husband is cheating on me. Lord, why didn't you just use him and show me that the man is him? Why did you just not use him as the man and make the dream straight up? And why did you not show me Therese's face? Why did you show me this strange woman in the dream to represent Therese? Why not just use the actual person? Have you ever wondered this? Huh? He's God. He has the power to give you dreams. And if he can give you dreams, he can put whoever he wants to put and can put. So why not give us straightforward dreams? What is the purpose for all these symbols? I was asking myself this question today as I was preparing this sermon. And the answer that came to me was this. God did not use the people in the dreams, namely Joseph, his brothers, and then for the second dream, his parents too. Because he was hiding something that was critical. What was he hiding? 
God was hiding the time frame. The timing of the dream or of the manifestation, he was hiding. And that's part of the reason God uses symbols and God uses all these unknown people to represent people in your life. Because sometimes when he shows you the people and shows you clearly what they will look like, you will get to understand the time frame. Because if I am a child and I get a dream in which I look old, it's obvious that whatever I'm seeing is not going to happen anytime soon. And sometimes when we tell ourselves that the thing is not going to happen anytime soon, we become so comfortable that we don't pray the way we ought to pray so that the thing happens. We become so comfortable sometimes that we make some stupid decisions leading to some consequences that are so hard to come back from. Hallelujah. So by using the wheat, the sun, the moon, and the stars, not even Joseph himself knows when this thing will happen. See, God did not show him himself as he was at the time, being a 17-year-old teen. Clearly, because the thing was not going to happen at that time. So God did not confuse him or give him this false hope to make him feel like it's right now as you're looking now, this youthful you, this is when they're going to bow down. No, it's not going to happen now. But at the same time, I still don't want to tell you when it's going to happen. Because I feel like even you yourself might interfere with the events that I wish to occur in your life that will lead to its manifestation. So, so as to prevent you from interfering with my will. And so as to have your very brothers who hate you so much to do their part in pushing you further into your purpose? I'm gonna get their minds thinking and working. I'm gonna cause such an anger to be aroused in them, such deep levels of jealousy and envy to be aroused in them that they're not even gonna delay in trying to wreck you because it's in the wreckage that I'm going to build you and promote you. So God says, you know what? I ain't going to use people in these dreams. Lest you get a sneak peek of the time frame. If I use people, your senses will allow you to see what so-and-so look like. And if so-and-so has gray hair, then clearly it's many years from now. Uh-uh. I ain't giving you any ideas, Joseph. So instead, I'm going to use some wheat and I'm going to use the sun, the moon, and the star. And you'll get it. The Bible says they hated him because of the dreams and because of his words. Let's think about that for a moment. When we lie our heads on a pillow at night, we don't even know if we're gonna dream. We don't control dreams. We don't give ourselves dreams. Yet here comes these individuals hating on someone because of something that they did not control. Joseph did not give himself the revelations he had. He did not give himself these dreams. Just like you. You did not give yourself the invitation letter. You did not give yourself the position. You did not give yourself the opportunity. You did not beg these people to like you and to favor you. 
for something over which he had no control. He was being hated. He was being envied for something over which he had no control. The Bible says, not only did they dislike him even more because of the dreams that he had no control over, but we hear that they also did not like him because of his words. Let's think about that for a moment. When we read verse 8, we hear what was spoken by the brothers. Let's read what they said and let's notice something together. The Bible says, and his brethren said to him, shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? They were asking a question. I want you to notice something. The fact that the word of God went on to say that they hated him because of his dreams and also his words means something that we might have overlooked. Clearly, Joseph answered them, but for some reason, the Holy Spirit has not documented Joseph's response. Read it again, verse eight. We see what the brothers asked, okay? We hear what came out of their mouths. They asked a question, and y'all know that when we are communicating, every question warrants an answer. When you ask a question, you expect an answer. They asked a question, but the Holy Spirit has deliberately omitted the response. And we know that he answered them because the Bible says they hated him not just for his dreams, but also for his words, for what he said. What was it that Joseph said? When they asked him, shall you rule over us? Shall you reign over us for real? You and you and you will not only be hated by people because of the revelation they got about where you're going, but some of you, I want you to pay attention to your words. It's your words that are burning them inside. Jamaicans would say, are your words are burn them. How could you have no money in the bank, but you speak so positively and so confidently? How could you be so ambitious when you don't have a dime in your pocket, how could you be so hopeful? How could you be so daring? How could you be such a risk avert? When people who are more educated and intelligent than you are not even taking these risks. How could you be saying these things what causes your affirmations to be so strong and so loud? What makes you so confident? Sometimes it's the thing that the people hear coming out of your mouth that causes them to hate your guts. You there talking, I am this, I am a child of God, I am successful, I am courageous, I am an overcomer, I am more than a conqueror, and you have all these I am affirmations. When truth be told, you don't even look like who you say you are. From whence came all that boldness causing you to say these things? 
What makes you think that you are going to be a CEO? What makes you think that you are going to have a ministry? What makes you think you're going to travel the globe? What makes you think you're going to be granted a diplomatic passport? Who are you? What makes you think you're going to get an, an exemption for your green card? Who told you you're going to get a miracle for your citizenship status? Sometimes it's what is coming out of your mouth that is causing the envy to be aroused in individuals around you. You see, the issue that Joseph brothers had with him was not so much about who he was at the time and what they were seeing at the time because he was just a 17-year-old boy. So they were not so much afraid of him as he was at the time but they were afraid of what he was capable of doing and who he was capable of becoming in the future. So what is threatening your haters is not where you are now, has nothing to do with what you're doing right now. God, through his wisdom, through his divine sovereignty and authority, has given them a glance of your future and that is what is posing a threat to your enemies. That's why they hate you so much. It's not so much about what you're doing now. You can't even help yourself now, but they hate you. Don't you get it? Your current is not what is posing the threat. These people are looking at your destiny. These people are seeing your potential and it's your potential that is making them uneasy right now. In your little innocent mind, just like Joseph's, you're there thinking that this is life. This is how I am right now. And you can't even see beyond where you are. Because having not been exposed to certain opportunities and resources, there is no way your mind can fathom what is out there to be explored. So you, in your little shelf, inexperienced you, amateur you, you're just there, happy going along, just being satisfied by the fact that the Father loves you, His hand is upon you, He has chosen you, He has favored you, and you're fine. You get up in the mornings, you have life, you're breathing, you eat, you drink, you're fine. You might not wear the best of clothing. You might not be able to go in a hotel room, something that you'd love to experience, especially going to one of those all-inclusive hotels. You wish you were driving in a Range Rover, but you see, it's not happening, but you're still content because the Father loves you and the Father is with you. So why is it that other people are uneasy when you step in the room? Why is it that other people are uneasy when you start a Facebook Live? Why is this one so upset when you build or start a YouTube channel? What is it about your TikTok? What is it? What is it that is upsetting that minister so much when you put up that post? What is it that is upsetting the first lady so much? What is it that is upsetting the pastor so much? What is it that is upsetting bitter Bishop Thomas so much? I'm only using my gifts. I'm just singing. I'm just dancing. God gave me my gift and I love to do what I'm doing. I'm not even being paid for what I do. So why are you hating on me so much? Because you are caught up assessing situations based on your current position and your current reality. But you see, those who hate you for some reason, they have gotten a glance of what is in you. They've gotten a glance of your potential, they've gotten a glance of what you possess. You don't even see who you are, but they do.
They might not get it in its entirety, but they've gotten a sneak peek because they heard you and they just saw, they saw it. They see this thing in you. And some of your enemies are rejoicing that you don't know what you have yet. Some of them are so happy that you are yet to discover some gifts that are in you. They picked it up. And already they're trying to sabotage you because they know you don't know. And they know that your ignorance of what is in you can actually be destructive. Because if you don't know what you have, how are you going to know that there is something that you need to guard from now? There's something you need to protect. So some people, when they recognize what you possess, they'll start inviting you to some parties and they'll start offering you drinks. Because see, if I get Charlotte drunk, then there's no way she's going to be who God says she will be. You see, if I get Maureen to be addicted to smoking, then of course I'll have her on that path that will divert her from being that CEO that I see in her. You see, if I can only get Trina to be in the streets, to have 10 men and to be battered by the men in the community. See, if I could only get her to be slandered by the men in not just this community, but the other surrounding communities, then there is no way she's going to be that lawyer. Because see, when Trina speaks, there's something about her voice. I find that she is a very articulate individual. She's very analytical. I find that this woman, she thinks deeply and she's she pays attention to details. There's something about Trina. But if I could only get her to rub shoulders with the wrong people, then perhaps she'll miss it. But the devil is a liar. Because when heaven sanctions something, when heaven puts its signature on something, let's be specific. When the king of all kings in the realm of eternity puts his signet ring with his stamp on something, it is yea and amen and nothing that the enemy does will be able to change that. When God says you are his, you are just his. When God puts a mark on you, the mark is just there. Hallelujah. Not even Cain in all his evil. Because God had a purpose for him because he was going to raise up a people through him. As evil as he was to have killed his own brother, God put a mark on Cain. And as long as that mark was there. Nobody, no matter how much they wanted to get rid of him, no matter how much anger a neighbor had and wanted to just stab him to death, no matter how much somebody wanted to use a cutlass and just get rid of him, no matter how much they wanted to stone him and to knock him in his head behind his back, no matter how much they wanted to kill Cain, as evil as he was, God put a mark on Cain and he could not leave this earth until the day of his heavenly expiration. So if Cain could have shed blood, innocent blood, murder his own brother, and God preserved him, what say me? Come on, what say you? You never shed blood. Some of you, you're saying you never did this, you never do that. If God could show such mercy toward Cain, how much more will he show toward you? Hallelujah. The enemy is not so much threatened by what he's seeing now. The reason they hate you is not because of what you yourself are observing in your life now. It's not about the now. See, in physics, there are two terms to which I'd like to introduce you. I told you before that I loved physics in high school. In fact, I was an A student in physics. For those of you who sat the Caribbean secondary examinations, CSEC, I did the sciences and physics was one of the subjects I did and I loved physics. I got a one in physics, I love it. So if you hear me use 
physics terms. Like the other day, some months ago, I talked about the conductors of heat. As I was explaining you just being fit to carry the anointing and the fire of God. I will use physics to exemplify something and to just further bring out the point I wish to establish tonight. Put these terminologies in your comments. In physics, there is something called kinetic energy, K-I-N-E-T-I-C. And there's also something called potential energy. They usually contrast each other. Kinetic energy is the kind of energy that you'll find in something that is mobile. Something that is moving possesses kinetic energy. So if I have a ball in my hand and I have it on a surface, a flat surface, and I release that ball with a force, I push it and it starts rolling, that ball possesses kinetic energy. It's moving. Something that is moving possesses kinetic energy. But on the contrary, there are some things that possess potential energy. If I were to have that same ball, okay, and I were to put that same ball on the top of a slope, let's say it is a huge iron ball and I put it at the top of a hill, okay? The ball is just resting there and I have the ball in my hand at the top of a slope. There are slopes on both sides. I want you to imagine that ball in my hand on that peak or at the top of that mountain possesses potential energy. I've not yet released it. When it's released, it has kinetic energy. But when I have it in my hands and it's not yet released, it has potential energy. I want you to understand that there's a reason it's called potential energy. Glory to God. Potential. It's not yet moving. It's not yet active. It's not yet rolling. But it has the potential to do so. Because if I were to just loosen my fingers and just to take my hands off this ball on the hill, it's going to immediately start rolling down. So as long as it sits there in that risky position, it possesses potential energy because it has the potential to be mobilized. As it pertains to you, it's the potential in you. Hallelujah. It's the potential energy in you that's threatening your enemies. You're not yet moving. You're not yet flagging. You're not yet taking leaps and bounds. You have not yet taken that step. You've not yet traveled. You've not yet signed them contracts. You've not yet stepped into that room. You've not yet presented yourself in that meeting. It has not yet happened. But the thing that is bothering the enemies is the fact that there is potential in who you are right now. It's the potential that you possess that is currently a threat to your haters. Your potential energy. Rakatama Soto. It's just as weighty as the kinetic energy, my God. Every time you see the term kinetic energy, you can just look out for potential. They always go together because they're always compared with each other. And the reason they're always mentioned in the same paragraph or sentence is because they carry equal weight. They are just as important. None is more significant than the other. 
We need potential energy and we need kinetic energy. Who you are going to become, the person you are going to be, the person the people will see on that platform. Mm. The person to whom they listen on Spotify, on Apple Music, on Amazon Music. The person who will share the stage with some of the greatest. Hallelujah. Who has not yet gone to those places. Who has not yet seen these things realize. Is just as effective and threatening. As that person they will become 10 years from now. Because see, whoever they're going to be and whatever we're going to see manifesting through them in the next 10, 20 years, it's already in their spiritual wombs. So Kadia is already carrying that ministry. She's already carrying that vision. She's already carrying that anointing. Sophia is already carrying not just those physical children, but also the spiritual ones who will come to her for godly counsel and advice. That's why they hate you. Because they know that what you carry will make room for you. Will cause you to go to places they themselves have not gone. They know that what you possess will cause you to meet some people they themselves wish they would meet in this life. They hate you because they know that what you have inside of you is what is going to cause that stigma to come off your family. Because when God starts to bless you, in every area materially and you're able to rebuild your grandmother's house and to move your family from that community when you're able to put them in a concrete house and to put them in a community that is gated labo kusha tamakusha the stigma will finally leave your family so they're threatened by what you're carrying. Your gift is what is going to open the door for you to encounter the people who will be resourceful to you in this life. Who will aid the cause. Who will advance the vision. Your gift is going to do that. And you know what else? The enemy is afraid of. Let's go back to Jacob. Whenever we hear, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Lord is saying to us in scripture, I am a covenant keeping God. I am the God who's not just concerned with you, but I'm also concerned with the generations that will come from you and after you. I am the God who does not just want to enter a covenant with you as a person, but I also want to enter a covenant with your offsprings. The Bible says that Joseph was loved by his father. Understand this. It is no mistake that Joseph was so loved and so blessed throughout his lifetime in spite of his difficulties. Because the name Joseph means he increases. Put that in the comments. Joseph means he increases. So there was a grace on this man's life that would cause him to naturally increase in every facet of life. Okay? 
You are the Joseph of your family. You are the one the father loves. And it's not to say that he doesn't like your brothers and your sisters. Because some of them, they're more beautiful than you, you would say. They're more qualified than you. But there's something special about you that he loves very much. That he gravitates toward. Hallelujah. The Bible says that tribes were named after the sons of Jacob. Y'all know there was the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Simeon, God, Naphtali, you name it. Amen? But notice there was no tribe that was called Joseph. There was not a tribe of Joseph. Understand this. The tribes were given not to Joseph. But don't think he was left out. What God did was God honored the grace that was upon his life and the calling on his life. His name means what? He increases. God gave Joseph double. He increased him even in the tribes, caused him to be represented by two sons of his, Manasseh and another. God did that. God did that. Understand this. That part of the reason the enemy hates you is because he realizes that not only are you blessed, even in your current situation, not only will you increase in the next few years, but he's threatened and uncomfortable by the fact that even your children are blessed. Even your children will inherit wealth. Even your children will find favor with God and with man. Even your children will have extreme levels of wisdom and understanding that will bring them before kings and queens and diplomats. My God, even your children, your offspring shall benefit from what you are carrying inside. Joseph's two sons got what he was carrying. They benefited tremendously from what he possessed. So you want to know why the enemy hates you, although you're not yet there? Although you are battering, you're struggling. And if only they could see your tears at night, you cry so much. Your tears could fill an ocean, you would say. Yet every day you get up to face people who are fighting you, who are envious of you, jealous of you. It's because of your potential energy. It's because of what you are capable of doing. We know that, as we said earlier, when the ball is rolling, it has kinetic energy. Praise God. But you see the one that is on that place? It is just as powerful and deadly as that which is already active. Come on. There are some people who are doing some things that you desire to do in your own life. There are some people who have attained levels of achievement and wealth that you yourself desire. They represent the kinetic energy, the ones who are already active, the ones who have already arrived, so to speak. But you, who have not yet been released, are just as powerful. You are just as impactful. You are just as effective. 
You who don't yet have a channel of your own. You who don't yet have your own ministry. You who don't yet have your own church. You who don't yet have a following. You who don't yet have a money. You don't have savings. Rabo Kataya. The enemy is afraid of what you already possess. So stop fooling yourselves. Stop asking yourself after tonight why they hate you and you've not had a good year. Last season, you experienced disappointments back to back. Failures back to back, you would say. Yet you are still the topic of some people's conversations. You're still the headline. People are still interested in you. If you weren't even doing anything last season, why are people even still thinking about you? Why are they even still talking about you? If you are such a bad person, why are they even interested in what's going on in your life? They see what you don't see. They've gotten a glance of something you yourself are yet to understand. There's a reason God has allowed some of them to see what is ahead of you before you. It's because they, these haters, these envious and jealous ones are also going to play a significant role in that thing coming to pass in your life. Don't even bother with them as they doubt you right now. As they second guess you, as they question you, as they scrutinize you, and as they have all these thoughts in their minds about you. God has allowed it to happen this way. So that when he brings that powerful prophetic word or prophetic revelation to pass he alone he alone will get the glory and the thing might not happen now it might not happen next year nor the year after understand this that abram had to wait so many years before the promise happened in his life Joseph was 17 years old. He had to wait all of 13 years before the dream he saw at 17 came to pass. Your God is a God of timing. And your God is so wise that he knows all those who are in your life at the moment. Some of the evil people who are in your life, God sent them. God has allowed them to be there. I told you this before, and I'm going to tell you again. It's someone who said it to me, and I'm going to say it back to you. If you don't got enemies, how will he prepare a table before enemies if you don't have them in the first place? If you don't have people who don't like you, how will he fulfill the scripture that he will prepare a table for you before your enemies? How will it happen if you don't have enemies to begin with? Some people have to hate you. Some people have to just dislike you and can't stand you. Because they are the ones before whom you are going to eat the good of the land. The Bible says, if thou art willing and art obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you reject and refuse, you shall be devoured by the sword. You will eat. As you trust him, he will cause you to eat. They will see you eat, you swallow, they'll see you burp. After all the hell they have put you through. 
after all the name calling, after all the slandering, after all the belittering, after all the sabotage, after all the persecution, after all the chastisement, after all the rejection, God is preparing the people before whom you will be exalted. Just like he was preparing the brothers of Joseph to be there indeed when he was promoted to the position of prime minister. Right now, the very people with whom you are contending today, he's preparing them. Because whether the thing happens in your current country or town or not, wherever they are in this world, they're going to stay right there and hear about you. If you travel from where you are now and you go to Timbuktu, even when you are in Timbuktu, they shall hear what has become of you. The greatness, the purpose. Hallelujah. The impact that you will have on people and the greats. Please stand as we prepare our hearts to pray. Hallelujah. Rabokotoriyama shataya. Lebeketariyama sataya. Labu shiki taro mushkerebe hindia tata. Zamu kuturiyaba koshataya. Stephanie Labakasaya, I hear Stephanie Kanama Kuturiaba. Stephanie, Stephanie, do you get the answer now? I don't know who I'm talking to, but the person's name is Stephanie. Lebo sha muku taroki sebru kandi shatama kute keti nas kutura shayamukura boka. There is potential in you. See yourself as that ball. A day is coming when you'll be released and you'll be just as powerful, impactful, and effective as those other balls that are already rolling. Is there anyone who wants to say yes to Christ Jesus this evening? You heard the word and you know deep down that you are a Joseph. You're a youth for the most part because you are inexperienced in certain areas. There are certain things you still don't know. Some of you are new converts, so you are a youth in the kingdom. And right now you are facing some lions, people who literally want to eat you up. People who want to devour you for what you don't know. To you, you are nothing. The Bible said about Jesus, whose father loved him. That there was nothing desirous when he came to him. The Bible said that he went unto his own, but his own received him not. They considered him stricken by God. And smitten too. In their eyes. He was not even cute. In their eyes. There was nothing that was kingly about him. Yet it is he. Who the father loved. And loved dearly. He said about Joseph. And about Christ who came from Jacob with whom he had a generational covenant coming from his father Abraham he said he loves him this is my son in whom I am pleased
Hallelujah. The Lord loves you. The Father has chosen you. The Father has put some things in you that are going to take your family out of poverty. The Father has put some things on you that will be inherited by at least three generations after you if he tarries so long. Do you want to say yes to Christ this evening? Because you feel in your heart that you are a Joseph. The odds are against you, but you know deep down that there's something about you. There are challenges and stumbling blocks in your way. But you know that the Lord has only just started with you. In fact, we know the work is finished in the spirit. But you know that there is a far way for you to go. You heard the message you heard what happened in the early years of Joseph you're inexperienced but you believe without a shadow of a doubt that you're going places you might not know how you might not know when God has hidden those things from you you don't know in all the messages he has sent you through these prophets and through these dreams, you don't get it yet. Some of you, you're saying, God, I've been hearing soon. I talked about this Sunday. For so long, you've been hearing people come to you to say, oh, it will soon happen. You will soon get married. So when? When is soon? I'll soon get pregnant. When is soon? When? Tell me. When is soon? See, it can be very frustrating when God withholds the timing of certain things for your life. But sometimes the secret pertaining the timing is better kept from you. Because maybe your excitement will cause you to speak about these things and end up speaking about them to the wrong person. To the person who was not a part of the plan to help with fulfilling it. Some people who don't like you will help to bring some things to fruition. But it better be the ones who God sent. Joseph's brothers hated his guts. But they were the ones God chose to help to bring to pass. The things that would happen in his life. I pray that the, the right haters will hate you. Does that make any sense? I pray that the right haters will hear the things that come out of your mouth. The right ones. Because some of them will think that they're about to destroy you. Some of them will work so hard in their quest to bring you down. Not knowing that the thing they're meaning for evil, God is already using to turn around for good. I pray the right haters will come to you. I pray the right people who are jealous and envy. I pray the ones that are so passionate about how they feel about you will arise. Because just perhaps... They are the ones who are going to help to get the ball rolling right now. They are the ones who will not hesitate to get things going. Because see, although the thing is going to finally manifest 10 years from now, understand that the work itself begins now. And you need some people who are so determined to tear you down, so passionate that they'll begin to do whatever they can do in their power. Right now, you need them. You need those kind of radical haters. 
Because the moment they start their work is the moment you yourself will begin to be pushed further and further. You'll be getting closer and closer to that promise, to that thing that you saw in your dreams five years ago. I bet you didn't know it. It's Karen who was going to do it. I bet you didn't know it was Bravo who was going to do it. I bet you didn't see this one coming. You didn't know it was going to be Alicia who was going to do it. I bet you didn't know it's Jeffrey who was going to do it. Of all persons, it's that one. See, sometimes God has to hide these things from us. All we need to know is that he brings the thing to pass. It shouldn't be our business who he uses, when, where, and how. That's not our prerogative. Let God figure that out. You just continue to be obedient. And you just continue to be positioned at his feet like Mary. And watch them hate you even more as the days, weeks, and months go by. And see how their hatred is going to propel you into purpose. It happened with Joseph. And if he did it for Joseph, how much more will he do it for you? So those of you who are saying yes to Jesus, just say after me, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I confess my sins before you. You know all the things I've said and done. You know me even more than I know myself. Wash me and make me clean according to your word. You said in your word, if I confess my sins, you are faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse me of all my unrighteousness. So Lord, on account of your word that you've exalted even above your name, cleanse me and forgive me. I accept Christ into my heart knowing that I'll need him to protect me and to preserve the promise. I need Christ in my life so that there can be a mark on me just like there was on Cain who killed Abel. There's a lot that is in store for me, but I need to be stamped and sealed because unless there is a ceiling I might meet my demise prematurely my God those of you who have said that prayer understand that you are saved not by your works not by anything other than grace and your faith in Christ. Please remember those of you who are watching on TikTok, Facebook, and YouTube that every Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m., except for Sunday, November 5, Every Sunday, including this Sunday, we are in the house of the Lord in Queens, New York. If you have not found a place of worship, come 
to the Marilock Hall in Queens, New York at 8000 Utopia Parkway, okay? St. John's University, use gate number four. When you come through that gate, parking is to your left on foot, make your first right, look for campus store. The Marilock Hall is right there. I said to you before, whether it's raining or it's snowing, it might be warm, it might be cold, we will be in that sanctuary because it is the place where many of you are already being healed and delivered. You've seen the testimonies if you've watched. If you wanna see what God has done, go to my Facebook page, go to my YouTube channel, go to my TikTok, I don't know, but you'll see what the Lord has been doing in our midst. Finally, I wanna say this, So, off late, every time I log into Facebook, I would see these stories in my feed. So, I kept seeing this mo bad person, or mo had, or mo bad. I just kept seeing all these stories surrounding this person that I said, no, I, I have to research who this person is. So, of course, I went on Google and I started to research who this person is, why this person's face is all over the internet, and why there are all these bloggers talking, especially African bloggers. So I get to understand that this individual was an African artist who apparently was killed, who was allegedly killed. But let me say this to you with the 5% that I have left on my TikTok phone. See, this, this phone, it drains battery a lot. Okay, so I'm seeing it looking dark just now, so let me try to say this quickly. You see that same thing when we talk about this hatred thing? As I read that story, I see so many things coming out. Of course, I'm not gonna go into details because the case is something that is being investigated. And a lot of people have all these things to say and I have to be so careful. Please to pray for the family of this individual. But if you're a young individual watching this, when you have the chance, I want you to look into this story a little bit because there might be some life lessons for us from this particular event or incident involving this person that has passed. As a young person reading this story, my heart goes out. I'm shocked. And in my heart, I'm saying, going forward, it's like, you tell yourself these things so often, but sometimes it takes something to wake you up for you to remind yourself that you have to be so careful And sometimes we are silenced on some things that we need to be talking about and some things that we need to share with other people so that people can be held accountable. I will not say much and anything I've just said is based on the word alleged. <laughs> but I want you to read because based on my understanding, which I will not share, I've gotten some life lessons, not that I didn't know them before, but I've been reminded of them. So I pray that the peace of God will surround his family as they mourn. I pray that the community that has been affected, even the African community that has some sort of an unrest going on, an emotional, social unrest, I pray that you people will be healed. And I do pray that this situation will get some sort of closure quickly but i pray that the spirit of listen as a prophet of the lord as a mouthpiece of the lord i pray that the spirit of truth will be involved in every aspect of the investigations i pray that the family will get the closure 
that they so desire to get. And I pray that all the people across the globe who need to learn whatever lesson will learn their lessons. Everybody has a lesson to learn. Okay? That's all I will say pertaining to this situation. Just so you know, it is all over my feed. I think by being followed by a lot of African people who have blogs and so on, I cannot help but to see all these stories when I log in. I'm learning. And I'm being very cautious. All right? Everybody have a wonderful rest of the evening. See you in church on Sunday at 10.30. At 10.30. 10.30 a.m. in Queens, New York. Please put the address in the comments for me. Those of you who've been trying to send me messages, if it's very urgent, you may send your messages to my email, Shadeen Anglin, the number two, at gmail.com. If you're looking for information about the ministry, how you want to support, how you can support, shadeenanglin.org. But if you have an urgent prayer request, shadeenanglin2 at gmail.com will probably work. The others of you who have sent your requests via WhatsApp, please give me some time to go through these messages. I'm just one person. I do have help sometimes, but you got to understand that there is an overwhelming number of people reaching out i don't know if i'm gonna see brother jason in church on sunday but let's see who we see on sunday the lord will send out his people and i pray that every person who comes in the house sick and in need of healing or deliverance will leave the marilock hall totally healed totally delivered did you see that miracle last night how that lady got healed on the live broadcast with the three lumps that disappeared. We had a prayer session after the live broadcast. I met with the intercessors and I didn't know that she joined. And she said, my daughter is fast asleep. No pain, no lumps. Put your hands together. God is amazing. We thank him. We give him all the glory. We give him all the praise. Have a great evening, everyone. I love you. Bye-bye. Remember to like before you go, Sister Kareem, Sister Khadija. Ensure that you hit the like button before you go. And remember to subscribe. Lena Clark, I'm going to be mailing your prayer shawl as soon as I get the chance. Bless you.